Okay. Um, good morning um, and welcome to the FCCJ. I'm your moderator, Andy Sharp. Um, I work at uh, Nikkei Asia. Um, in many ways, it's a shame we're holding a press conference this morning. Um, we're into the 500th day, or 501 now, I think, of the uh, Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine. And um, so this is why um, our guest today, um, the ambassador, uh, the Ukrainian ambassador, Sergei Kosonsky, will speak for us today on this, on this um, very sad um, anniversary on, of this conflict that is lingering on and is still causing great troubles to many people across the world. Um, I'll keep this very short because um, Ambassador Kosunski is not a stranger to the club. I think he's spoken here, this may be the fourth time or possibly the fifth, um, certainly the third time since the conflict started. And so I'll keep this brief and hand over to the ambassador who will give us a short speech of about 10 minutes, and then we'll open to the floor for Q&A. Okay, Ambassador, uh, Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, indeed, yesterday we crossed uh, 500 days since February 24, 2022. Uh, and uh, uh, 500 days ago, no one in the world could have predicted Russia aggression. We met in January uh, last year here, and we were talking about possible threat and possible nuclear threat specifically, what is going on right now in Zaporizhia. But even then, we were not sure that such aggression would, would happen. Uh, today is very useful to look back and uh, to risk forecasts by major think tanks, as uh, I did uh, uh, for curiosity. and. What I found along COVID, Europe after Merkel, climate change, divided Europe, crisis in the United States, debt crisis, and even incomes, whatever you want, but none of them mentioned Russia as a global threat. Uh, we now know that uh, that was uh, uh, a kind of uh, miscalculation on the side of uh, major thinkers. Uh, we uh, see that uh, in 500 days that they changed everything. In those 500 days, Europe has become more united, more dynamic, more courageous than ever before. Not only have United EU countries refused to buy Russian energy, but they have also imposed unprecedented sanctions on Russia. Just like yesterday, there was a chronic deafness in the West regarding, regarding Ukraine's membership in the European Union and NATO. And today, Ukraine has the status uh, of an EU candidate. This is, without exaggeration, a tectonic shift in the direction of our strategic goal, which was defined at least two decades ago. During those 500 days, the world has become less safe. The international security system and arms control regime has been completely destroyed. For the first time, the aggressor has used a uh, tactic of nuclear terror, deliberate, consistent, and brutal destruction of complex civilian infrastructure, the largest scale use of drones, cruise and ballistic missiles, mines, cluster and phosphorus bombs in history. This is the first colonial war in the era of Facebook and Twitter, when crimes cannot be f hidden, and therefore the phenomena of public confess of crimes, boasting about stolen, murdered, and raped children by criminals themselves has yet to be studied by forensic psychiatrists. 500 days earlier, we were told no to almost our request for modern weapons. Everyone expected Kyiv to fall and express concern, sometimes deep concern, but general expectations were that we cannot stand against such a formidable power and probably three days, maybe a week, and uh, the Russians will take over Ukraine. Today, everything has changed. Although we are still waiting 
for decisions that will finally turn the tide of the war and bring, uh, and bring it to the only possible victorious end. We are still waiting for F-16, long-range weapons, and the invitation to join NATO. And before that, security guarantees. 500 days have made the impossible real. During those 500 days, the myth about the second army in the world and its invincible weapon were dispelled. It turned out that the Russian armed forces are not only not the second army, but not an army at all. That's a mixture of bandits with criminals and private mercenaries. It became obvious that Russia is a political bankrupt, a society and technologically backward country in the stage of degradation, unable to produce modern products, and only by violating the sanctions regime does it keep entire industrial afloat. Its place, as a vassal, its place as a vassal of China is now clearly defined, and it is circle of friends, dictators, imposters, and tyrants. We now know that what could happen when imperial schizophrenia lies, mythologizing and total information control become key elements of the state policy. Putin has managed to create a unique model of this dictators, dictator, dictatorial regime based not only on fear, but also on slavish obedience, dehumanization of conscious and social behavior. And the Stockholm syndrome seems to be completely adequate diagnosis of the relationship between the government and society. For the first time in history, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for the head of United Nations Security Council member state. The number of open criminal proceedings related to military aggression of Russian Federation against Ukraine is approaching 100,000, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. They still say we have no, we have never existed, should not exist, but we have, and we have reminded the whole world that we are. They threaten us with our and our partners with nuclear weapons. The latest. I guess it was yesterday, Medvedev and other threat to bomb free nuclear power plants in Ukraine and dozens in Europe. And this only makes us more determined to wipe fascism out of face of the planet. They call themselves not only a state civilization, but also a civilization of civilizations, calling for the destruction of the world in which there is no great Russia. Well, uh, with the world, have hurt them. Global defense spending has exceeded $2 trillion, while the worst of the Cold War, it did not exceed $1 trillion in comparable prices. Security strategies are being rethought, new defense alliances are being formed, and rearmament is underway. Even pacifist countries like Japan has to, to sharply increase defense spending and resume the development of new generation weapons in response to security threats increased significantly due to Russian aggression against Ukraine. For the first time since World War II, Japan has provided support to armed forces of another country, albeit non-lethal, and for the first time Asian country, Micronesia, has severe diplomatic relations with Russia. Never since the foundation, its founda founding have NATO countries, especially those on the eastern and northern flanks, been so active and united. Finland, which had maintained non-aligned status for more than a century, had already become a NATO member, and Sweden has made great strides in the same direction. There has not been an unprecedented unification of democratic countries in the uh, Ramstein format. Negotiations are underway to open NATO office in Tokyo, and the Japanese Prime Minister will participate in a summit in Vilnius. All this would have been impossible yesterday. The transformation of world order caused by Russian aggression and our resistance to this aggression has significantly accelerated the process of global dialogue 
between the world major powers. Summits of world's leaders are no longer passing events and joint statements are no longer obvious. We may recall last year summits in Asia, including G20, and this year summits of G7, and we may recall that when, whenever Russia ex uh, present at those summits, there are no joint statements. Once Russia is out, there is a unified uh, position of uh, democratic developed countries. Uh, and it is not just about Ukraine, it's about other pending issue in the, uh, in the world which is still there, including climate, for example. The friend of four attitude is now determined by the position in relation to Russian aggression. Uh, the regime of sanctions imp imposed or not imposed and uh, level of trade and economic relation with the aggression, aggressor. Unexpectedly for many, it's turned out that the war in Ukraine is a significant factor in the reforming of global arms, food and energy markets. The 500 days of Ukrainian resistance has restored the democratic world's unity, sense of common purpose, and the ability to act in a situation where the values of freedom and, de de and democracy, human rights, the international legal system itself are being challenged in ways unseen, unseen since the World War II. And the West must recognize that. If Russia remains an aggressive nuclear weapon state with veto power in the United Nations Security Council, the world can expect new experience of another 500 days of war, and not necessarily in Europe. All potential aggression, aggressors must realize that Newton's third law works differently in geopolitics than in nature. The force of aggression will be always met by a much more powerful counterforce, not an equal one. We will win if even we have only spades to beat Russians. But it would be better and more effective if we have F2, F16, Patriots, and Atakams. It is my duty and pleasure and honor to express my deepest gratitude to Japan for its uh, unbelievable staunch support to Ukraine. We very much value not just the bilateral support, we very much value position of Japan as a part of democratic community, uh, and we appreciate its efforts to bring the truth about this war and position of the democratic world to global South countries, to uh, many those who are still thinking about whether uh, to uh, join uh, democratic alliance or still uh, try to work out uh, with Russians. Uh, we see victory in three simple steps. Borders of 1991, they must pay retributions for what they have done in Ukraine, and that is enormous amount of money. $400 billion we are talking about is just a fraction of it. And definitely, war criminals must be prosecuted. That's why we work with democratic community for international tribunal, uh, which will be taking care of that. As I said, we have more than 100,000 cases, criminal cases, properly opened, executed, and continue to investigate against physical, uh, not just theoretical, but we know all of them because of our intelligence, because of their stupidity, but we, we know names of those perpetrators. We believe it would be fair if everyone in the world would see consequences of an aggression. Russia opened 500 days ago, Russia opened Pandora box. It must be closed and sealed forever. Thank you for your attention, and now I would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, just a quick reminder to keep mobile phones uh, um, switched off or on don't disturb mode, please. Um, okay, so, Q&A now, um, if you could, um, anyone who wishes to ask a question, keep the question short and state your name and affiliation, please, and I'll try to get to as many people as possible. Okay, um, start with this gentleman here. Takuya Nishimura with Hokkaido Shimbun. Thank you very much for this morning. 
And uh, the situation in Zaporizhia uh, nuclear power plant is very uh, worried. And from the viewpoint of Japan, because Japan experienced the two devastated uh, uh, events, one is atmo atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and second is Fukushima accident. So uh, as the ambassador uh, to Japan, what, what would you uh, send a message uh, from Japan to your home country or the world about the devastation of nuclear uh, materials? Thank you very much. Uh, the situation in Zaporizhia is extremely dangerous and very fragile. From the beginning of aggression, Russians put uh, explosives uh, in, uh, in and around the, uh, the blocks. Uh, full of uh, 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 nuclear fuel. Then, you know, they blew uh, the Kahovka dump, which was a source of water for a cooling pond. And cooling pond is still in place. Uh, there is still water in it. And if uh, uh, nothing could happen uh, for some time, it will be enough to cool down reactors. But the point is that for some time, uh, if we would not restore supply of water to this pond, at some moment, there could be something very similar to what happened in Fukushima. Uh, then we, uh, our intelligence, we carefully monitor what is going on. We saw they put explosives uh, on the roof of two reactors. Uh, they could easily blew it. Uh, uh, it will not cause major destruction because those reactors are pretty much uh, safe uh, for for such kind of an assault. But uh, as you may guess, any destruction in the nuclear power plant is unpredictable, may cause unpredictable consequences. Uh, the, no, in, under normal circumstances, when Ukraine uh, was uh, in fully in charge, uh, there was an automatic monitoring system with cameras and everything to monitor what's going on in real time. So in our center uh, for security, nuclear security, and in, MAGA, in uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, they saw in real time what is happening. Right now, the system is cut off by Russians. So we have to look at it from satellites and from intelligence, uh, which is not equally reliable. Uh, we, uh, what we, uh, so the, the point is, what we can do with that? Uh, on one hand, uh, you have a temptation to organize like a clandestine military operation to liberate the station. But uh, it's very well fortified by Russians. And since it uh, has a lot of explosives, we cannot guarantee that they would not blow, blow it up and then blame us. Therefore, the military, con uh, military solution was, uh, is the last on the, uh, uh, on the list of what we can do. Number one, what we can do to use as much as possible international legal system and the uh, I would like to say power, but uh, maybe authority of International Atomic Energy Agency. That's why we invited uh, the mission to the station. Uh, it's uh, it's very small mission. As our president mentioned in the recent interviews in Europe, for two or three or four people to monitor huge territory, almost impossible. But still, uh, the mission is important. Uh, still, we... Uh, request assistance from uh, International Atomic Energy Agency all the time, we have a suspicion that they're going to do something. And when it comes to your direct question with Japan, uh, definitely that was one of the reasons why President came to Hiroshima. Uh, to speak uh, first, uh, to speak to all the community, to G7, to G7 plus uh, uh, guests, eight important guests from Global South, and then bilaterally with Prime Minister Kishida and then to address Japanese people because we fully recognize efforts of Japan uh, for, to, uh, to stop proliferation of nuclear weapons, to, uh, to somehow make it is impossible to use nuclear terrorism uh, threat uh, 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 in the world. But that is where we fully coincide and where we try to work together. And, uh, 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 Japan has quietly uh, continued its efforts to support our position, International Atomic Energy Agency, and with international partners. And if you, uh, the, the 
fact that uh, the today risk of uh, nuclear accident in Zaporizhia is a little bit less than 10 days before. That's because of our international partners' pressure on Russia and clear warning that this is, should be absolutely excluded from any option. Uh, again, uh, that would open Pandora box. So all many countries have nuclear power plants. And if you talk, because I, I did, I talked to some experts on that, and not just in Japan, in European countries too, how you protect nuclear power plant in this case. And actually, this is a big headache, because normally nuclear power plants are protected by local <laughs> police or gendarmerie like in France, not by army. Because if you put army and if you, if you put uh, anti-missile system at each station, that's completely changed the security environment. So this is, this is something nobody wants to enter even. So therefore, it must be clear for everyone. Many countries have nuclear power plants. You can't protect each plan like a separate unit. The system must be in place. That is where we coincide and we try to work with the international community, although we still very, very uneasy about uh, uh, those weapons and we request again and again Russians and uh, international community to push Russia to remove all the forces and all the uh, explosive from Zaporizhia and let, let it be in a safe state until we fully liberate our territory. That's what I can tell you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, please. Good morning, Ambassador. Uh, I'm Kanehira of TVS Tokyo Broadcasting System. Um, as you know, the US government decided to uh, uh, supply a uh, so-called uh, cluster bomb uh, with your country, with your, uh, to your country. Um, some countries, uh, including uh, the, uh, your allies, uh, including uh, the Canada or UK or Spain, expressed have expressed uh, how to say uh, the uneasiness to use uh, this uh, controversial asno. What is your, the basic position to this issue? Thank you. Uh, you probably know that uh, conventional cluster munition entered into force 2010. Uh, 111 countries, including Japan, are members, and you mentioned Canada and other European states. But still, neither United States nor Ukraine, nor Russia, nor China, nor India, not many other partners in Central Europe, they are member of this convention. So uh, for us, it's completely legitimate to use those uh, munition. And uh, uh, for uh, United States, it's completely legal to transfer this um, uh, munition to Ukraine. Uh, it is not transferred uh, without uh, any uh, uh, preconditions set. So we have obligations. We uh, agreed not to use those weapons on the territory of Russia. I mean, uh, officially recognized territory of Russia, not what they claim. We, we uh, have uh, an obligation not to use it against civilians, and we are not going to. Uh, this munition will be used uh, solely uh, on a battlefield uh, because it's an effective weapon to break the lanes of defense Russians built on our territory. Uh, uh, the period uh, in spring and some part of summer, uh, Russian Federation uh, spent uh, building three lanes of defense in south and east of Ukraine. They are heavily fortified uh, lanes, and to penetrate them, uh, you have to have, uh, uh, as any military expert will tell you, you have, uh, best you can do, that you have uh, air superiority. You can attack those lanes uh, from, from air, and then infantry can go and take the, uh, the, the territory. In our case, we don't have this superiority, so we have to use artillery, uh, because if you use tanks, it's uh, a huge loss of equipment uh, because of mines. Uh, there are zillion uh, of mines uh, put uh, by Russians uh, in front of our uh, troops. 
So those cluster munitions are very effective from this point of view. And as, again, as I said, we have certain obligations and we definitely will fulfill them. Uh, uh, although it's all legal uh, from a point of view international convention, you can easily check uh, that uh, those countries who are not part of the convention, they can do uh, whatever they want. But we, we, we uh, value position of our partners. That's why, as I said, we have certain obligations to minimize uh, uh, the possible threat to civilian population which could be caused if we really use it on a battlefield. We have as well obligation to demine the territory where those cluster bombs will be used because some of them uh, may not explode at time of attack. So later on, it could explode as a mine. So we, we have obligation to demine the, the territory. But, and let me finally uh, remind you that cluster munitions were openly used by Russia in cities, in Kharkiv, in Mykolaiv, uh, so uh, in Bakhmut. So they, they use it uh, against civilian population in residential areas. Uh, so uh, uh, we believe that it would be unfair if uh, uh, they can do whatever they want and we cannot reciprocate in a similar manner. Although our goal not to kill civilians, our goal uh, to uh, remove Russian army from our territory. If they would withdraw tomorrow, we are not going to use this munition at all. Thank you. Okay, yes. And then, and then you after this. Uh, hello, sir. Ryotaro Sato from Nikkei Asia. Very nice to meet you. Um, one question. Uh, Rebel Democratic Party in Japan, LDP, the ruling party, have uh, recently uh, set five uh, reasons uh, for weapons to be transferred to um, a, third, a third country, including you know, rescue and patrol and that sort of thing. So uh, what sort of uh, uh, weapons uh, do you sort of uh, uh, anticipate or expect to be transferred from Japan to Ukraine? Or is it just uh, what they say, just those um, equipment that uh, stuck to the tanks and so just demining or um, bulletproof vest and trucks uh, are being reported, or do you have some other expectation that more, more you are um, hoping to get? Uh, Thank you. You know, it's a sensitive question. Uh, we fully recognize the uh, Article 9 and the position of the government of Japan about supplying of lethal weapons to any other country. Uh, at the same time, we welcome, very much welcome the positive development positive in terms that non-lethal equipment could be supplied. We have already uh, 100 trucks uh, 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 transferred from uh, uh, self-defense forces to armed forces of Ukraine. Uh, it's, it's trucks, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, nothing uh, um, uh, lethal. Uh, at the same time, the next stage of development which we saw uh, uh, that suggests that more uh, sophisticated equipment could be supplied. First of all, demining, that's you, you're exactly right. It's, you know, th there are different uh, estimates. Uh, in between 10, 20 years, we need to demine our territory. The number of mines so huge that you can't even put it in your mind. Uh, and uh, definitely, this is something which had to be taken care of. So the mining number one. Number two, it could be electronic. So it uh, could be radars uh, and anti-drone equipment uh, and anti-missile equipment too. Uh, let's put it honestly. We, we, again, we, had, we understand that lethal equipment, it's not welcomed by the society in Japan. I saw polls and they say that people in Japan, they would not support. We don't want to be uh, a, you know, a spoiler of uh, public, uh, public position towards that. But at the same time, we know for sure that there is a very good equipment in Japan which could be used anti against drones and against as uh, uh, equipment for surveillance to see because when we have good eyes, when we fully understand what's going on, definitely effectiveness of use uh, of uh, uh, weapons increases. So. 
uh, we have uh, different uh, discussions with the government. We uh, transferred our request uh, on uh, whatever possibility exists, and it, it was up to the government of Japan to decide what could be done, what is doable, and on what conditions. So uh, we, uh, first of all, we value support of Japan in terms of humanitarian assistance, financial support, and political support as part of G7 and uh, uh, soft superpower in the region. But uh, now probably uh, it's time to consider more uh, uh, serious equipment which we can use uh, to uh, make our counter-offense more effective. Uh, no, there is, there, I mean, uh, th there are several uh, uh, I, I think how to say it uh, it's a kind of new kind of equipment which can be used against drones developed by Mitsubishi Heavy Industry and Kawasaki Heavy Industry you could see, you could see them at the military exhibition which happened recently uh, in, in the spring uh, they use lasers, for example, so, but that's exactly against drones. It's not missiles, it's different. Or you can deal with drones when you uh, uh, influence communication uh, between drone and the operator. If drone is blind and cannot be managed, it's useless. So those kind of equipment, we believe that uh, uh, Japan, whether already produced or in, is in development, so we can use them uh, because you, you know probably that it's already like every night, every night we have attacks of drones uh, on our cities, uh, and they're very simple equipment, uh, but unfortunately very deadly. Uh, to manage that, we need to use all kind of uh, equipment which has been produced in the world. Uh, to, because this is just uh, to protect the civilian population. So equipment to counteract the su suicide drones? Yes. Yeah, including suicide drones. There are <laughs> many of them. Yes. Including them, yes. Okay. Um, yes, please. I'm Tomoko Igarashi from Mainichi newspaper. Uh, thank you for this opportunity today. Um, my question is about uh, NATO summit, which will uh, begin tomorrow in Lithuania. Uh, what discussion do you expect in the summit, uh, especially regarding uh, Ukraine's joining NATO? Uh, as some countries uh, welcome to Ukraine, but some countries are uh, saying it's uh, a bit too early. Thank you. Um, definitely, from our point of view, Ukraine deserves to be in NATO, uh, and it is interest of NATO to have Ukraine inside, because our army, let's put it bluntly, now the most experienced and powerful army in Europe. So, uh, and if you would simply put it, when NATO was created, against whom the defense, Europe needs def collective defense, against whom? Against former Soviet Union, right? And against Soviet Union. So the threat is still there. It just change the name. We fight this threat. It would be clear that for NATO, it is quite obvious uh, that having Ukraine inside would increase ability of NATO to counter threat coming from, from the East. We, the best, best we can expect that invitation to join NATO. At the same time, we understand that this is a process. It's not going to happen on July 12th. It's not just reasonable. We understand that there will be a long process of discussions, negotiations, and finally, uh, it must be the decision must be ratified. So, but invitation must be there. It is clear in NATO interests. So uh, we uh, we may uh, 
look at it a little bit differently, but uh, when we look at the history of uh, EU and NATO, you will see different uh, uh, precedents uh, when countries joined those institutions, having territorial disputes, being divided, but still a decision was taken. We believe that first of all, it's political decision. So uh, uh, another issue which is going to be discussed and we believe will be discussed very thoroughly, the security guarantees between the end of the war and NATO membership. So there will be a process and this time should be covered by uh, some security, real security guarantees, not another piece of paper on the, uh, disguised under the name of Budapest Memorandum, but real guarantees. Because what we believe that if a ceasefire and peace will come, and still we have a Putin-like regime, maybe it will be not Putin, but Patrushev, who knows, but still the same regime in place in Russia, they will use time to produce more weapons and to begin war again. This is nature of Russia. So that is why we need security guarantees that we will be able to cope with consequences of the war, demining, rebuild the infrastructure to begin normal, to regain normal life, uh, and then uh, uh, to uh, enter into uh, real process negotiations and uh, membership in EU and NATO. But we must be protected. We, we cannot do that uh, in the time, uh, endless time of war. Uh, so that's what we expect will be discussed. We understand that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, already 22 memorandums with members of NATO were signed, which supports uh, Ukraine membership. And very recent one, it was a very important statement from President Erdogan. Uh, as former ambassador to Turkey, I'm very happy that Turks, in spite of all the uh, plus and minuses, Turkey is still staunch supporter of Ukraine membership in NATO. This is very important for Black Sea. So we believe that uh, the majority is on our side. Uh, but definitely, again, being a responsible member of a democratic community, we fully recognize that there are rules and conditions and we must go, go and follow uh, step by step. But invitation must be issued. That's what we expect. Hi, my name is Junpei Tanaka from Nippon TV. Um, I can't speak English very well, sorry. Uh, one question, how would you describe the 500 days of Russian, inv Russian invasion? But, but I, I think I did, no? And uh, how, how would you describe the 500 days of Russian invasion? In Can you suggest me to repeat my statement? <laughs> I think he already said this in his uh, statement. Statement, yes, yeah, uh, yeah, no, yes, yes. Section yes. statement, the whole there. So section. Well, <laughs> he wants it again. <laughs> no, no, right. no. So sorry, so sorry. Yeah, just keep it short, please. Ah. Uh, I don't want to repeat again and again uh, that uh, those 500 days they changed not just Ukraine, they changed the world. They changed uh, uh, our attitude toward many geopolitical issues. Uh, we, uh, it's uh, become a, a, a catalyst of uh, the process of changing the world order. We see influence of uh, this aggression on almost every issue which has been discussed. Uh, I'm not saying we are happy about that. We, want, we don't want those 500 days of war. We wanted 500 days of peace, but uh, it was not our choice. We now uh, trying to do everything in our power to achieve victory and ceasefire as soon as possible. The only that we all must take into account, in Ukrainian society, there is no territorial compromise with Russia exists. Eight million people displaced. Eight million in Europe waiting to be to go home. Uh, very recently, I visited Osaka. 
in Osaka, uh, we have now organized Ukrainian community and they open Ukrainian restaurant. Uh, I advise you to visit it, it's very good food. And there are six or seven uh, Ukrainian evacuees working there. Among them, one woman very uh, uh, from Mariupol. And w when I talked to her, uh, all of them want to go home. But she told me, she was crying, and she told me, I have nowhere to go. I won't go home, but I have no place to go because first city is occupied, second my home fully destroyed, I have nothing. So that's mentality of millions of Ukrainians, and that must be clear. Territory must be liberated. That's, it's our duty, it's our business to rebuild, to, uh, to uh, bring those people back. We need people. We cannot, I mean, the country exists for people, not otherwise. So we need them to return. And that, is, that means that those 500 days uh, brought us very clear understanding that the desire for peace should be uh, very clearly set uh, with uh, our uh, obligation to uh, return those people and to bring them home and to build this home anew. So that's what I can tell you. Okay, uh, yes, please. Hi, Jadine Redak, Kabahug from the Japan Times. You've put a lot of emphasis on Western nations and NATO, um, but given China's diplomacy efforts with brokering a truce with Saudi Arabia and Iran, as well as you know its interest in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, what do you think Beijing is in a better place than Western nations to try and have diplomacy efforts? Uh, this is the most complicated uh, issue because there are no simple terms when you can describe Chinese policy. Uh, China has a global interests, that's what we understand. First of all, uh, the paramount priority for China, of course, to set up the new rules of engagement with the United States. I mean peaceful engagement. Uh, the uh, civi uh, ci um, uh, civilized uh, terms of competition. Uh, first of all, uh, in terms of economy and uh, definitely in terms of security because we all uh, know what kind of concerns uh, uh, exist in a democratic world. I don't like to call it uh, West because this West includes a lot of East. So democratic world is very much concerned about the China Sea or situation around Taiwan and other issues. So therefore, uh, there are many layers of uh, efforts from China uh, to be part of now a uh, uh, global community. On one hand, you have strategic initiatives put forward uh, by Xi Jinping uh, for global perspective uh, of, the, uh, of, of the world. On the other hand, you have very particular, uh, I could not say plan, but points when it's related to uh, uh, war of Russia against Ukraine. Uh, as we said many times uh, that we can agree with some of them and we are very grateful for specific Chinese position when it comes to nuclear threat. Uh, China expressed many times it's unacceptable uh, uh, that uh, the, any uh, terror on New Zaporizhia is unacceptable, and we believe even when it comes to use of uh, tactical nuclear weapons, again, the uh, position of China uh, was quite clear. At the same time, uh, we uh, believe that uh, uh, the uh, very naive hope that we can uh, set a peace with Russia uh, in trading our territories for peace, not with Russia. Uh, it, is, it is absolutely clear uh, that uh, uh, there is no reason uh, for Russia to take our territories. They never been Russian. They are not Russian. Uh, we have our borders recognized by international community, and that is absolutely uh, uh, absolute majority in Ukraine supports uh, such attitude. So we try to work with China. We try to uh, open all the, uh, to keep all our communication lanes with China open. 
You know, President uh, Zelensky talked to President Xi Jinping. Uh, we exchanged some letters and we exchanged some, uh, we have ambassador recently appointed to China. Uh, so finally we, would f we think we can enter into very careful discussions about uh, w w what can be done. At the same time, definitely I saw very recently in Nikkei, it was an uh, investigative report about uh, supply of some drones from China to Russia. Uh, we think this is very unfortunate development. We don't think that uh, you can make a poker face and say, look, we don't know where those drones uh, are being used probably for hunting in Siberia. No, whatever you supply to Russia, they use for military purposes. As well, by the way, as they use uh, used Japanese cars uh, exported to Russia in tens of thousands. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt that part of this uh, export goes, it's not forbidden. I mean, we cannot uh, claim that there are any violations of sanctioned regime, but uh, we, at the same time, we cannot ignore the fact that they use those uh, relatively cheap uh, used cars as a relatively cheap Chinese drones uh, to use uh, to in, the, in, the, in the military in the East, uh, because this is Russia. Even if they tell you they're not going to use it, they will use it. Uh, you never can trust them. So uh, we want to work with every uh, partner, including China, uh, to uh, uh, prevent them uh, from uh, supporting Russia. Uh, in a, I mean, in, to prevent them in a dialogue, in, in explaining to them that it is not this war is pure colonial war. It has nothing to do with NATO membership or threat to Russia or whatever nonsense. We can count probably 10 different versions of uh, why Putin uh, began this war, uh, changing from time to time by, by, by Russian government. None of them is valid. Uh, you have now uh, Finland, uh, member of NATO, Soon it will be Sweden. The border with NATO increased like for 2,000 kilometers. Nothing happened. Uh, there are no threats, no screaming, no move of troops. So this is all nonsense. The, it's pure and clear colonial war. And if China is such a sensitive to uh, lost century, to colonial past, they must understand this is colonial war of 21st century. And it is better to be on the side of good rather than on the side of evil. Uh, but it's a dialogue. So we will see how it will turn out uh, because it's in the development now. Can I ask a question myself, please? Um, so we saw reports overnight that <clears throat> France appears to be blocking the opening of a NATO office in, in Tokyo. Um, obviously, this will be decided upon in the summit, but it looks unlikely it will be agreed on in, in Lithuania this week. So what are your thoughts generally on this issue, on this NATO office in, in Japan? And of course, given the events back in, back in your country, what do you see as NATO's role in the Indo-Pacific or in, the, in East Asia? Uh, honestly saying, it's quite complicated for me to comment on that because you have to know all the details. From my outsider view on this problem, uh, NATO office in, uh, uh, in uh, Indo-Pacific could help countries in the Indo-Pacific to understand more comprehensively the concept of collective security. Because when you talk here, in the, I mean, in Europe, it's not, a, it's not a question. Everyone knows what is NATO, how it operates, uh, there are different voices inside NATO on different problems. France was always, uh, has its own vision on this process. It's okay, it's normal, it's democracy. Uh, but when it comes to uh, Indo-Pacific, it's always a question why we need to have this collective defense, what does it mean to have collective defense, uh, w the Quad, uh, uh, one of the developments, uh, the recent uh, joint military exercises by ASEAN countries was another good example of interesting development because this concept uh, must be very clearly understood. And as far as I know about this office, 
it was uh, designed uh, to bring this knowledge and experience to Asia, to share information with everyone in the region. What does it mean to build collective defense? Because there are a lot of concerns, concerns about military pro proliferation, about spendings, about political process, about cohesion in military forces. So all those issues, if you go and ask, here you have a NATO office. We, we had a NATO office uh, in Ukraine, not exactly representative of NATO, but uh, a NATO information office in Ukraine for does, I don't know how many years, more than 10 years, definitely. I work with them in my previous capacity as director of Diplomatic Academy. It was very, very fruitful cooperation, let me tell you. That was very educational. The most uh, efforts they spent to explain to Ukrainian society what is NATO, because probably many of you know that before war, the percentage of those who were in favor of NATO membership was not that high, 35% maybe, 40 It was quite difficult to persuade people, but now it's completely different. Uh, that's exactly because we learned it in a hard way. So it's better to learn it from in a peaceful way, way from a NATO office rather than in a hard way if anything would happen and then suddenly you have to look at this collective defense as a very important tool to keep any aggressor at bay. That's what I can tell you. Okay, thank you. Any more questions from the floor? Okay, Lotano, a follow up. Oh, hi, just a quick question, different question. Uh, there was a report of the, the, the uh, Minister of Transport negotiating uh, um, a, a transfer of bullet train technology, <laughs> Shinkansen technology to Japan, to Ukraine. Is this true? And what, what's your implication? What's the goal of the Ukraine government at the moment? Uh, we, we are very grateful uh, to uh, the host country, to Japan, that uh, several of our ministers were able to participate in uh, G7 ministerial meetings, not just on the level of president and summit in Hiroshima. Uh, uh, among them, uh, it was ministers of transportation with Vice Prime Minister Kubrikov participated in it. Uh, we, it's not yet, nothing is decided. We discuss what Japan can do in reconstruction phase, because this phase will come. And probably you know, it was announced in London by, uh, by Minister of Foreign Affairs Hayashi that uh, probably, I, I don't know when, maybe uh, January, maybe February, uh, it's reasonable to think, uh, we will have bilateral reconstruction conference here in Japan. Uh, Ukraine and Japanese companies will participate. That will be the biggest massive event devoted to this issue of participation of Japan in reconstruction. Being an ambassador here and uh, talking to endlessly meeting with uh, uh, companies and to association, business associations in Japan. What I see that Japan's uh, role could be in major infrastructure projects, not a small, something small, which could be done by other countries. But your experience in 100 years, at least four times after three earthquakes and one war, you was able to rebuild Japan. You was able to rebuild uh, uh, economy and infrastructure. You have immense experience helping other countries. So from our perspective, one of the very interesting projects could be Shinkansen. In Ukraine, the territory, if you look at geography of Ukraine, it's very reasonable to have uh, this bullet train because from Kyiv in each direction, you need, you have, okay, 700, 800, 900 kilometers. It's not that long for Shinkansen, two, three hours one way. And it will change Ukraine. And that technology itself needs different level of uh, understanding of construction and management. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you have immense experience of uh, building bridges, for example, highways, urban planning, and agriculture technologies, which can be used in Ukraine for strategic purposes. What I'm saying, it's not about small investment. We are talking about strategic investment. And we believe that all those issues could be discussed. Nothing is decided. It's all the very fluid in between 
companies, governments, but we believe that when this conference will come, uh, probably it will be a very big delegation from government and from business from Ukraine. So finally we can talk. In London there was already a preliminary meeting between our teams. Uh, they uh, set up certain uh, issues, uh, but uh, that conference will be major uh, effort to define uh, the uh, uh, Japanese participation in future reconstruction, which we believe will begin next year. Uh, we cannot wait until war ends, because in Japan, as you know, everything should be planned well ahead. So we, it's better to start now to talk about that, to plan for future efforts, rather than to wait until we liberate territories, there will be peace, and then you begin planning. So you are losing time. We want to do it as quick as possible. And by the way, we have full support of international community. That's why we have conference. We had conference in London. Mm -hmm. So that will be another effort uh, toward this direction. When is the conference? Uh, we it was defined end of the year or beginning of the next year. Mm -hmm. I we don't know yet. I believe reasonably think it's January February. But but it's up to the discussion. Is it fair to say that um, Japan's role in supporting Ukraine is going to be bigger in the reconstruction than it is now during the conflict? Yes. Yeah, it would be fair to say, yes. And actually, that's what Japan can do. I mean, really, the experience, when you carefully look at the, what have been done by Japan and other countries from this perspective, it's, it's immense. Mm -hmm. So nobody knows better than Japan how to reconstruct. Okay, I think we have time for one final question. Uh, yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask you, what is your basic standpoint on the issue of disputed island, of Northern Ireland of Japan, and the dispute between Japan and Russia? And what would you say about the increasing military facility in those islands? Uh, extremely easy question. I'm very pleased to say that we officially recognize Northern Territories as territory of Japan. It was recognized by the parliament, the, the president, and this message was delivered. Uh, and I can tell you that now on all official maps will be issued in Ukraine, those territories will be marked as territory of Japan. Mm -hmm. So definitely we 100%. And what does they do on uh, specifically on Atorofu? This is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, uh, I mean, that's the only Russia can do. They cannot develop those territories. They build military bases, one after another. And if you look, at, this is very simple uh, exercise. Look at Etorofu, where is C400 now? And circle 400 kilometers. Against whom? This is Hokkaido only. There is no other territory. And th this is absolutely unbelievable, because as you probably know better than me, for how many years Japan was always promoting peaceful policy toward uh, Russia, policy of cooperation, negotiations. And what happened? Nothing. They now even forbid those uh, relatives who lived uh, to visit graves uh, on Eterofu. So pure humanitarian issue. So this is absolutely unacceptable. For us, Northern Territories, this is Japan. Full stop. We cannot exclude anything. When we deal with Russia, if you ask me uh, 510 days ago whether it's possible, I would say it's possible, but it's unthinkable. Unthinkable happened. So we must be ready. That's, that, but it, the answer to your question lies in Ukraine. If we punch them in the nose, if they would know that any aggression anywhere by anybody will be met by international community with huge force, they will never think even about such aggression. But unfortunately, we allowed them to do that. In 2008, it was Georgia. 2013, it was Crimea. Now, 2024. We must put an end to that. OK, I think we're going to um, wind it up there. Okay, we'll draw this to a close. And um, thank you, Ambassador, as thank always, you for your time. I hope I don't see you in 500 more days um, uh, discussing the same issues. 
Hopefully it will be victory. <laughs> I hope so for you, your sake, yes. Okay, um, can you give the ambassador a round of applause? And I believe everyone should remain seated while he leaves. Okay, thank you very much. We'll thank draw you this very to much. a close. Thank you.